Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll tour the International Peace Garden. But first, our guest joining us now is Dr. Nicholas Barroth. Dr. Barroth, thanks so much for joining us. You are from the North Dakota State University Political Science Department, and you're here to talk about the election races coming up this season. I certainly am. Thank but, you for having me here. Before we get to that, tell the folks a little bit about yourself and maybe your background. Well, again, thank you for having me here. I always like to discuss politics on a brisk uh, October. Um, I'm at the chair of the Department of Political Science at NDSU, and uh, I've been here in North Dakota since 2004, so pay attention to local and state politics, that's my area and such, and I've been teaching since then, so yes, I've done this before, and it's always a pleasure to come here and uh, talk to you about the uh, regional local politics. When well, I you say teaching, what, what is it you teach it, uh, in particular? Well, my goodness, <laughs> I have a focus on state and local politics, but most students fear me because I teach the uh, political ideologies course, too that they have to take in their first couple years, so. Okay. Well, you know, we bring you here every couple of years, of course, as, as uh, the races heat up. We're in the midterm elections, uh, right around the corner. How are you seeing the national races not right now? Well, the way I'm looking at the national races is that if you're the Democrats, you're starting to sweat right now because they had a really good summer as um, the incumbent party can have in the uh, midterm elections where it seemed like um, people were rallying around their candidates that they were going to perhaps come out of this uh, elections, maybe even a winner and such. But all the polls that I'm seeing, all the uh, sort of conversations are going on is that all those uh, important races in Pennsylvania, Ohio and so on are getting closer and closer that the Democrats who are ahead are suddenly within the margin of error. So if you're of a nervous type right now, it's really touch and go for the Democrats. And it could turn out, I mean, they could lose a bunch of elections by a very narrow margin. And the end result is that this could be a, well, a disastrous midterm election for them. And, and the, not always uncommon in midterms as we talk, have talked about, uh, how much is inflation affecting the Democrat mm -hmm. situation and President Biden? Well, I think the inflation situation is affecting them quite quite a lot. When you're looking at polls, um, inflation, economic issues tend to be the top thing that people worry about. Uh, abortion's higher than it usually is, but it's usually second or third place. And so you see a lot of polls saying, hey, this is the inflation, this sort of uh, downturn in the economy, uh, they hold the president very much personally uh, for it. So, um, you know, we recently just had some numbers released by the federal government saying that the uh, inflation rate is still very high, that it hasn't dropped at all. And seeing this, that we're coming to the last few weeks of the election, this is nothing but bad news for the Democrats. Um, if this was a, a year where the economy was okay and not you know, seemed to be in such a bad situation, they could actually do quite well this election. But unfortunately for the Democrats, uh, the economy, any way that you look at it, uh, looks very troubled. And again, the polls show that that's going to be one of the things that uh, determines who wins these elections. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the impact Donald Trump, you know, still seems to have on Republican mm -hmm. uh, primaries and the candidates? Well, he seems to have a huge impact on uh, a number of the states that are uh, sort of touch and go over to, to, uh, in terms of who's wins. In uh, Georgia, in um, Pennsylvania, Donald Trump's uh, recommended candidate has been nominated by the Republican Party as uh, the person he's endorsed. And that sometimes creates problems for the Republicans in that state because they're not always the most obvious uh, choice, the easiest winners and such. Um, so uh, we'll see how it plays out. It's not as if there any other state Republicans parties have rejected these candidates. Once they've got the endorsement and won the primary, um, they've rallied around them. But um, uh, there's a number of Republicans that seems to indicate that Donald Trump made it more difficult for them because some of the candidates are going to be harder to win. Um, but Donald Trump has still the support of most Republicans. Most Republican supporters give him quite high margins and such. And so if this person's going to say, hey, this is the candidate for me, well, it's usually, it's oftentimes enough to swim those, swing those primaries. So he's still a, a big player, even though he's not on the ballot. Hmm. And despite all this, and you, you hit on it a little bit, it appears uh, Democrats might hold on to the Senate. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, you know, key races in key states are making headlines. And uh, of course, you got uh, candidates like Dr. Oz, Herschel mm -hmm. Walker, yeah. you know, uh, what are your thoughts on those races and how they're playing out? I mean, they're in the news a lot. And, yeah. and 
back and forth on how it's going to turn out. I mean, they're going to be record breakers in terms of spending, in terms of how much they attention they get, because the uh, Democrats' control of the Senate right now is as narrow as you can get, 50-50 and having the vice president. And so if they just sort of hold court, they just sort of don't lose any uh, candidate in any races this um, uh, election, then they have a really good um, uh, chance of controlling the Senate and accomplishing stuff here and there. Um, in the next couple years, because that would be the big fear if you're Joe Biden. It's just two years of fighting across the board. And if Democrats maintain um, the Senate, then at the very least they can sort of uh, pick and choose who they want to nominate and put into place in terms of the uh, uh, federal courts. So, um, you know, uh, it, it, if the Democrats end up maintaining the House, and most people would look at this uh, as like a tremendous win for the Democrats, uh, maintaining uh, control of the Senate when it's so tight, and well, who knows, maybe even the House, that would be. Um, almost unprecedented. I mean, you have to go back pretty much to 2002 before the last time where the uh, incumbent party did quite well in the uh, midterm elections. So we're all watching it very closely. But it, again, it's got so many different part, moving parts going on, it's kind of hard to make predictions about what's going to happen next. I mean, I'll, I'll take a crack at it, uh, but it's, it's, it's always done with, you know, uh, a grain of salt. Well, exactly that, which leads me into, we're going to ask you a couple of crystal ball, mm -hmm. maybe two or three crystal ball type questions, the if. You know, what if the Democrats lose both the House and the Senate? Yeah. Do you think then that the Democrats would approach President Biden and ask him, you know, not to seek re-election in 24? Well, I mean, there'd be a lot of things that would happen if the Republicans got both House and the Senate, anything up to and including impeaching uh, President Biden. And there's all sorts of stuff that could go on with uh, negotiations over budgets and such. So if you were the Democrats, if you're uh, President uh, Biden, if the Republicans were to get control of Congress, it would be, um, yeah, it would be lowered expectations in terms of what you could get done. The problem is that, um, you know, replacing Joe Biden doesn't necessarily, doesn't really solve the Democrats' problems. They don't have, uh, you know, they have the presidency and the economy's doing poorly, and that's always going to be a problem no matter which party, what time that you're going to be there. So um, replacing Joe Biden doesn't save, uh, solve that. And also, who do you replace him with? There's no obvious sort of person that you say that this person's the leader of the Democratic Party. Party. I mean, the last time that there was a, a real contested um, a nomination for president was back in 19, oh my goodness, 1976, if I remember, oh, 1980, I'm sorry, Jimmy Carter and Ted Kennedy. And Ted Kennedy was running against uh, Jimmy Carter in the primary, but he was like one of the natural leaders in the party. You could look to him as one of the leaders. You don't really have that for the Democrats now. One person that they could unite beyond and um, legitimately think that they could replace a, a sitting president. Mm. Well, uh, let's uh, shift gears, I guess, and move mm -hmm. maybe to more regional races. Uh, North Dakota, U.S. House. Yes. Uh, of course, uh, we're Democrat. Of course, Mark Haugen, he dropped out, leaving only mm -hmm. incumbent Kelly Armstrong and then uh, independent Karamund Mund, who uh, uh, is challenging. Uh, how can what can you say about that race? Well, first of all, I'll have to complain that we don't do regular polling in North Dakota for the uh, statewide elections. You get some polls from the candidates' uh, organizations, but those are real suspects. So if I do any predicting, it's like I almost have no polls to work from at all. So, so, but I'll do it nonetheless because, well, I guess that's what I do for a living. Um, what? Um, I think that the House election is, uh, in the states, uh, kind of unusual. Like, there's something, you know, having an independent, a famous independent, uh, get involved in the election was kind of unexpected, you know. Uh, it's kind of hard to see anybody except the uh, Republican Kelly Armstrong winning the uh, House election, but it's something different. And so people are paying attention to it to see, well, does, does her um, particular uh, uh, issue, you know, abortion rights, does that have a big play in the state? Or does she, you know, being something of a celebrity, does that help out and such? And it's really hard to say, again, no polls. Uh, but you got to think that uh, it's hard to see how she would do worse if there was uh, just a Republican, I mean just a Democrat, how she could do worse than a Democrat. Because um, again, this is a state where the Democratic Party has had really, uh, really diff real difficulties getting good challengers for statewide office, and that cl includes the House. So um, in terms of the election, I expect Kelly Armstrong will win by a pretty safe margin. I don't think that it's going to be all that tight. Uh, but when you have Democrats getting 30 or so percent in the last uh, few elections on these statewide things, even getting, you know, 40 percent, you know, in other states, that would be a total blowout. In this state, if she was to get 40 percent, that would be like, you know, oh, my goodness, that's way above and beyond what I expected. So, I mean, uh, 
something like that could happen. She could do better than maybe the Democrats have done recently with their candidates today nominated. Um, but it, it's hard to see uh, her actually winning it, uh, particularly since the Democrat dropped out. You know, ideally, you know, you have sp several people splitting the vote, and it's not head to head. Uh, but that didn't happen for whatever reason. Yeah. Well, okay. So, but the if, you, as you mentioned, so if if Munn does lose, do you think she's setting herself? Uh, for a future in, in politics and in other races? That's an interesting thought because I'm not quite sure what her career path, what she wants to do with her career, you know, go into broadcasting, politics, or, or whatever the case might be. If she does decide to go into politics, it is sort of like, well, a good start. You know, you do get name right recognition uh, or statewide recognition for your name, and um, you get the sense that you're not a beginner anymore and that this isn't some sort of, you know, um, uh, just for fun sort of candidacy instead of like really wanting to win. So that would be uh, kind of interesting to see that. The only problem is, is well, what's her natural home? Where does she go with the Democrats? Does she remain independent? Uh, what does she do uh, when she's not running for Congress? So there are some possibilities there. Um, it, again, it'd be interesting to see what happens because we haven't had too much, um, uh, you know, uh, luck or success with the third party candidates or independent candidates uh, sticking around for the long term. And so again, it'd be interesting see how that uh, resolves itself. Okay. And of course, the uh, Senate race with a three-way battle between incumbent uh, Republican John mm -hmm. Hoven, Democrat Katrina Christensen, and Independent Rick Becker. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that race? Yeah, that again is a, a race that it's really hard to see Hoven losing or even getting below 50 percent. I mean, again, it's not like um, the Republican Party has some sort of magic act going here, but the uh, Democrats have had a hard time getting resources and raising money and um, attention for their candidates, even if they think they have a good candidate. You know, Christensen looks like she would, is a good candidate. Um, but I mean, it just, it, it's just become such a Republican state at the statewide level. Now, there is always the out, outside uh, possibility that, you know, uh, Becker sort of splits some of the votes. Um, uh, Christensen gets all the Democratic votes, and it gets to be something s closer, particularly if Hogan gets below 50 percent. Um, but that's, that, again, it's really hard to see that happening. I hate to, you know, uh, poo-poo her chances. Um, but I think uh, what would be interesting to see if that, if uh, Becker does take anything that seems to be a Republican vote out of Hogan. So if he's below 60 percent, if he's below 55 percent, it would seem that he would have had, um, uh, Becker would have had some constituency within the Republican Party. So part of it is also seeing, you know, is Becker coming out of this as a new political figure in the state? If he does well, you know, gets some sort of percentage votes makes it a closer race than expected. That could happen. Or does he just become an also-ran? So it's interesting to see because, again, Becker, I think, wants to have a continuing career. Um, how that works out, well, that will be, again, another post-election sort of uh, subject matter for consideration. Sure. Well, let's, let's turn our attention to uh, the attorney general race mm -hmm. uh, with Drew Wrigley and Tim Lamb. Uh, facing off with each other. Can you tell us about how you see that race? Well, again, I'm going to have to lean with the Republican cross st uh, for a statewide election. Um, but normally, um, if this was a state where there was two even parties, um, it would be kind of up in the air because there's been a lot of uh, stories back and forth uh, uh, about the uh, Republican and, and um, his uh, re how he's replaced um, the the old the old guard, and um, I could you know you could see it being a little closer if in, if there was a Democratic Party that um, had time and money to promote a candidate. So Drew Wrigley seems like he has a pretty clear shot. Although, I mean, again, there's stuff to ask questions about. It's not like uh, he's a blank uh, slate, you know. And so if the Democrat could get the uh, um, uh, election going about, you know, Wrigley's, well, uh, communications with um, the national government, with the Trump administration doing the aftermath of the elections and such, it could be a little bit more interesting. But again, you know, this is where I, I sound like a broken record where I say, well, it could be interesting, but again, my prediction is that the Republican will win and probably pretty handily uh, in this time around. And a lot of that you lean toward, because so what has happened to the De Democratic Party in North Dakota? You know, was it just Dorgan, Conrad, and Pomeroy? They were so strong in mm -hmm. bringing home the bacon, so to speak, and 
and now there's just doesn't seem to be anybody that that uh, carries the mantra for the Democrats out there. There's part of that. Part of that is too is that we're much more polarized as a voting uh, public as the electorate right now. You know, back in the '90s and early aughts. Um, you could have um, uh, candidates very easily vote for Republicans for governor or for uh, state house and senate, and still split their ticket and vote for the Democrats um, for the Congress and such. And it was a very it was from outside of state. Seeing the uh, Democrats win the congressional delegation for North Dakota was always seen as a bit of an oddity, like how it came about. And once the Democrats, Pomeroy and the rest, started retiring. It seemed as if things um, kind of reverted to the norm that uh, people expect. I mean, the same thing happened in South Dakota as well. You got a lot more polarized where people think of state elections, you know, for Senate as more of a, a national thing than rather, rather than the old case where you might have been that you had met Pomeroy before and liked him or that you could, you know, you might have disagreed with the Democrats, but maybe Dorgan did a good job with uh, agriculture and farming. Well, that doesn't matter much anymore. And so if most people kind of had Republican feelings and they were voting, voting for a Democrat, when it nationalizes, when it polarizes, suddenly they're not going to even give the uh, Democrats a, uh, the time of day. So that's part of it. Um, you know, again, once Dorgan and the other delegates uh, or congressional delegation left, it also seemed as if the uh, uh, Democrats lost something, not their soul or something, but something about them that never got replaced. You know, some, there seemed as if their candidates uh, had more and more difficulty making a splash in the state and raising money and having much impact in terms of polls. And it's kind of hard to say exactly what happened, but I think the polarization where you would maybe in the state you might once have given a Democrat, um, you know, a second thought. Now it's like you're either a Democrat or Republican and you don't cross over. Yeah. We don't have a lot of time left. A couple of subjects I'd like to hit on. Are you concerned based on the 2020 uh, presidential election denial in some quarters that going forward there will be a growing number of concerns about election results? Mm hmm that is a worry because a lot of um, democracy, I mean, you'd like to think it's the Constitution, these rules and regulations, and you just go through your checklist. But a lot of it's like also based on the idea that, well, good faith sort of argument, you know, the acceptance of results and such. And so when you, uh, when you see a number of people run and based on their ideas that uh, elections are stolen or that they might be, it is concerning because, again, if people don't, if you start, if the elections start losing legitimacy, if people start seeing them as sort of like a... Uh, I don't know, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, up for grabs in ways that, you know, the common voter doesn't have an impact on. That's just going to be bad for our democracy. That's going to make it bad for, um, you know, having faith in our government, having faith in Congress and such. So it, it is quite disturbing. And so how it will play out, well, again, I'll have to wait and see. But um, again, you know, it, uh, you, you, you hope these things would resolve themselves. And the fact that we're still talking it after two years again, means that there have been some pretty fundamental changes in American politics. So, real quick, is the political climate of this country as bad as the media portrays it or not? Can you talk about that just briefly? Well, I mean, you know how they say, one of these expressions out there is that Twitter isn't real life, um, that, you know, that uh, you see a lot of the disputes and people not getting along, you know, gets a lot of prominence. You know, I think a lot of people don't really think about politics on a day-to-day -day basis, like, you know, where they see their neighbors or co-workers and say, hey, that's a Democrat or Republican. Um, I mean, if they start talking about it, yeah, of course it all comes up. But I think most people um, maybe aren't like us. Like, we, I spend all my time thinking about politics. I mean, you uh, talk about it all the time. And I don't think people follow it quite that level. I mean, they'll be much more concerned on November when the election day is coming here. But I, there's a lot of people who can take a break from politics, you know, which maybe sometimes is a healthy thing. Well, Nick, we are out of time. If people want more information, where's the best place for them to go? Well, there's a lot of places, but 538.com is a good one if you're trying to get polls and some sort of discussion about, um, uh, you know, the political tendencies of American voter. And it's pretty even-handed as these things go. So I always recommend people to go that and see how they take a look at the, all the polls from across the nation. Well, thanks for joining us today, and thanks for all your insights. Well, thank you for having me. Stay tuned for more. Located in the center of North America, the International Peace Garden has been a living symbol of the peaceful relationship between the United States and Canada since 1922. Join us as we celebrate peace through art, music, and nature in this profile.
Well, there's a lot of highlights here at the International Peace Garden, but most folks come each summer to see the 25 acres or so of formal manicured gardens. There's big displays of annual flowers and a big sunken garden that has a lot of perennial flowers. On top of that, we have a year-round conservatory full of an incredible collection of cacti and succulents. There's a peace chapel with incredible quotes about peace and cooperation on its walls. Another thing is the 9-11 memorial that has remnants of the Twin Towers and what happened that day on 9-11-2001. The conception of the International Peace Garden is really a pretty fascinating story. In 1929, a collection of gardeners through the National Association of Gardeners uh, met in New York City. They were primarily from Toronto and New York, and they thought it was important that as two peaceful countries living along the longest unfortified border, that that peace and coexistence be recognized in the form of a garden on the border. And it's truly special because there is no other international peace garden. This is the only one, and it is a tribute to a lot of folks in the 20s and 30s who really pushed for the International Peace Garden to be centrally located in the continent rather than on the East Coast or the West Coast. What happened this year at our 90th anniversary was really wonderful because it came at a time following two years of low visitation due to the pandemic where we were able to bring a lot of people on site for a big weekend to celebrate 90 years of the International Peace Garden. There were all sorts of vendors, makers, musicians. We had traditional indigenous and Métis powwow demonstrations and storytelling. When you have this much space and this beautiful of a setting, you can do a lot and bring a lot of people here and everything you see here is its own form of art. It's a beautiful setting that really contrasts nicely with the surrounding prairie. So when you think of the formal manicured parts of the garden, we really try to make sure that the edges of that meld in nicely with the surrounding forest. And then as we start to bring in more sculpture, more performing arts, really just trying to highlight how wonderful it is to appreciate art when you are outside and in a more natural setting. Probably in August, we start thinking about what next year's layout of the flowers will be, because it really is an annual process that begins right after, right as the season's wrapping up. And so this year, we wanted to recognize International Music Camp and all the music and arts that they bring to the grounds because they were off the last two summers due to the pandemic. The relationship between the International Peace Garden and the International Music camp is one that goes back almost 70 years and it's a special one because the International Peace Garden is not the International Peace Garden without International Music Camp. So the International Music Camp is for campers mostly ages 10 to 19 um, but we also have a four-day adult camp at the end of our season and it's just so fun to see people of all ages coming together to make music and art. When you walk around IMC today, you're going to see orchestra, so string players practicing all over the place. We also have band happening this week, so there'll be concert band folks practicing. And for art, we have sculpture, painting, and cartooning happening. So campers will come and they'll work on their art, and at the end of the week, they either put on an art show or a concert, kind of a capstone experience of their week. It's really incredible what happens when you have faculty who are so excited to work with the campers and then the campers who are so excited to be here and just the magic of them all working together always produces amazing results. I think for a lot of young people coming to the International Music Camp is actually a really validating experience. Um, so often we maybe go through our life and, and we think, oh, I'm the only person that really enjoys this. But when you come to the International Music Camp and when our campers come here, they are surrounded by people with similar interests, whether it's their counselors or their teachers or the other people in their class. They really get a lot of validation of like, it is okay that you have a passion or an interest in this. And then that goes back home with them and that really encourages that growth, that change, that progress within communities. Um, and I think it helps make all of our communities, large and small, a better place, a healthier place and a stronger place too.
The Peace Gardens has been a beautiful an important factor in what the International Music Camp is. Being in between the two countries, truly being international between nations. And in music and the arts, we're devoted to bringing people together from different backgrounds and different life experiences. And what a great place and what better place to do that at a location that is known for promoting and celebrating peace across the world. The International Peace Garden is such a special place because there's really nothing like it in the world. We're on an international border. We're funded by and really honored and shared by North Dakota and Manitoba and Americans and Canadians as a whole. It's really incredible to think that so many people come from all over because they really see the value in a place that stands for peace, that wants to promote and advocate for peace, and to do that through a natural setting given that we're in the heart of the continent, close to the geographical center of North America, it really kind of brings home the theme and how important peace is to all of us to be centered. And that's, that's one thing that I think draws so many people to the International Peace Garden. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching. Funded by the North Dakota Council on the Arts and by the members of Prairie Public.